and welcome back to Podular Modcast. My name is Tim Held, and this week we have Jason Mayo from Nobula on the show. If you've been keeping up with the last few months of episodes, then you've heard me talk about the polycinematic and chord pilot, and you've even heard slash seen me uh, play with those in some cool patches, and we will be doing more in-depth demos on those uh, coming up in the future, but I figured I wouldn't overload you with, uh, with Nobula stuff because we're going to talk about it for an hour here in a moment. So what I'd like to do is talk about the new Catalyst sequencer from 4MS. As I stated on last week's episode, a sequencer that you really vibe with, that uh, just speaks to you and has a good workflow for your brain, is just such a fundamental necessity uh, in your system. And I can't believe it's taken me this long to uh, wrap my dumb brain around that. And I say this without hyperbole, and yes, they are a sponsor of the show, but I think the Catalyst sequencer may be um, like my favorite sequencer I've ever worked with. And while I haven't used a whole lot of sequencers in the Eurorack format, at least not ones where you write the sequence, I've used a whole lot of just like random, um, you know, gate and CV generators with quantization on them and whatnot. Um, but I have messed with a lot within a DAW and other synths. So, and one of the reasons I've, I've never really gravitated towards them, I think is partially my ADD brain and, uh, maybe some dyslexia mixed in there. It's just always like removes me from the fun, but the catalyst is like part of the fun. And I'm also gonna use the wave transformer from Earthquaker Devices. And I have found that that module pairs really, really well with the three body oscillator from Schlappy Engineering. So I'm gonna use those. But before we get into that, let's check out this week's featured artist. This week's featured artist track is called Polygon Dreams and comes from Low Pass Park. Let's check it out. Alright, so we're going to get into this patch. I am using the Expert Sleepers ES9 to get 10 individual tracks into my DAW, and then I mixed them a little bit after that. I'm also using the 
circuit tracks from Novation, and this thing has just become a real staple of my setup. So a lot of the drums, other than the ones that I'm playing and some of the synth stuff is coming from the Novation. And I'm using the sync output from the circuit tracks to go into a clock divider in my system. And that way, everything in my system is in sync with the drum beat in uh, the, the circuit tracks. I really do love this thing. It's really, really fun. And I highly recommend it if somebody is looking for a way to maybe have a smaller setup for uh, live gigs. This thing is a powerhouse. It also has some audio input so you could run you know, a stereo or two individual um, external sources in and use some of the effects and whatnot you can there are two midi channels um, so you can control all sorts of stuff like i control the nobula modules with this all the time um, so yeah sorry past tim i have to interrupt you to do a little adr here to uh say i realize i told you what i'm using in the patch but not really how i'm using it and uh, the video is not going to be a whole lot of help in discerning that. So I've decided that I will, uh, I'm going to revisit this patch on next week's episode. And when I put the individual video up about it on YouTube, uh, my, my revisitation will be a part of it. So for now, I just invite you to sit back, relax, and check out this piece pastiche i don't know if pastiche is the right word this jam that i cut together out of uh three different takes and cut it together rather quickly so i guess like structurally it doesn't make sense but i think i just have a bunch of cool parts that i wanted you to check out uh so yeah let's do it <laughs>
Introducing Otterly. Otterly is an all analog multi LFO module from Expert Sleepers that offers deep and flexible modulation in a compact size. At its core, Otterly delivers four LFOs with different speeds derived from a bass frequency control and spread function. Turning the spread knob clockwise expands the difference in speed between the channels, while turning the speed knob increases the bass frequency of the LFO array. This intuitive two knob function is a powerful way to create modulation curves which are musically related to one another or mix signals to create a polyrhythmic complex LFO. So if you need modulation sources, Otterly delivers a flexible palette of related waves ready to add movement and texture to any parameter of your patch. With a solid baseline functionality and a handful of quirky tricks, Otterly from Expert Sleepers is sure to get your patch moving and grooving. If you want more information on Otterly, please visit Expert Sleepers online. Link in the show notes. Um, Jason, it's so nice to uh, have you on. I've been wanting to have Nobula the, the, as, as a company on for a while. And I uh, got the pleasure of, of hanging out with you, oh, it was a week and a half ago or so for about an hour. And we talked modules and stuff. So we're yeah, going to have- It was have, meant to be like a five minute chat. And an yeah. hour and a half later, <laughs> we kind of had to get on with our day. Yeah, that's what happens when you get two people interested in modular talking exactly. to each other. There's no five minute conversations. No, no. That's why I started recording them. I was like, this is great content. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd like to just start. Let's, let's, uh, let's, I'm going to get your background here because, um, you know, I learned from our conversation the other day that you had a pretty, pretty roundabout way to finding yourself, you know, in the position. Yeah, of it's a kind of modules. circular, uh -huh. one of those circular stories where your kind of career starts sort of here and goes all the way around. And then you eventually you find yourself coming back, not to mm -hmm. where you started, but kind of in the same, same little area. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, as a kid, as a teenager, I was building synths back in the, oh, would it be early eighties, late seventies. Um, and, uh, my, cause my dad was, he was a, he was an engineer, he was an electronics engineer, okay. um, which was quite unusual you know, for those days, you know, there was quite a, um, an unusual thing to be doing. And he had, um, he had a, a factory where he made, um, equipment for the food industry. And, um, that involved a lot of electronics, a lot of mechanics. And, um, so I kind of grew up around that. I didn't study it myself, but I, I kind of grew up around that. And, um, I kind of didn't think electronics was that interesting. Um, but I thought since were kind of really, really cool uh, at the time. And um, so that's where, what I wanted to do. Where did you first he, see or hear of a synth this time? Like where, think, where was that coming from? Yeah, it just sort of came. I can remember I can remember hearing the radio in my sister's bedroom. It must have been about 76. And hearing this this song with this, this incredible sound, this kind of sequencing it was just the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. Um, and that was uh, I Feel Love um, by Giorgio Moroder. Oh, okay. And, uh, and so I think I was just hooked from that point. I just wanted to know how to make that sound. And then later I discovered Jean-Michel Jarre and Equinox. And, um, you know, I wanted to know how this was done. It was very difficult in those days because you didn't have YouTube. You couldn't just look, look stuff up. <laughs> yeah. You just had to say, it was like somebody said, Jason, Jason, tonight there's a program on the BBC about synthesizers. You know, so, so, so my, my kind of education in sense was, was quite limited, I suppose, mm -hmm. at the time. But yeah, so I, I kind of was just hooked and I had uh, access, pretty much unlimited access to all the components I needed. Um, so, uh, so my dad bought me, um, a kit to make a polyphonic synthesizer. It was called a transcendent DPX. And, uh, it was one of those, it was kind of like, um, a Selena string synth. It was one of those synths that didn't really have many filters or anything like that. It, it, it just had a like, kind of, um, what they called an oscillator divider network which we were very okay. excited about at the time, because at the time it was all VCOs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, oh, this is digital thing. And it, it, it just divides the notes like perfectly in equal temperament from one end, from one end to the other. Um, and the great thing is you can play all the notes at once. It's not limited to one note at a time. And um, I was kind of 
I'm seeing the seeds of your future modules. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This already. Because <laughs> it was a very early disappointment. You know, I spent, must have spent six months. Um, I mean, it was a great kind of father-son thing to do. But, you know, when we finally got this this thing working and I played it, it just sort of, it just sounded really dead. It just, the, the, the there was no kind of intermodulation. An octave still sounded like one oscillator. It was so perfectly in tune. It just didn't really have any... Mm -hmm. life to it so um yeah and then then after that i just started buying synths i think i'd you know i mean this is a 61 key synthesizer right so i had to build 61 uh circuits i mean we had the oh, circuit wow. board printed but each circuit board was like you know a little amp a few diodes resistors and you know that sort of thing and i did that 61 times i mean i could <laughs> by the time i was 13 i could solder anything to anything, mm -hmm. you know, it was just, <laughs> I probably had lead poisoning because it was all lead as well <laughs> yeah. in those days. Uh, so yeah, so that kind of, I got, got my fingers burnt slightly with that, but not, nonetheless got into synths and then got into um, sound effects. I got a job doing sound effects in Soho in London. So I was like a Foley engineer, you know, one of those guys that does the, yeah. the kind of yeah. click clops with the coconuts and, and stuff. So I was doing that and, um, I was also, you know, doing my synths in the background. And um, and then one of the producers says, look, we've got this guy. Uh, he's just bought the uh, catalog to um, Thunderbirds and a whole load of kind of 60s TV um, themes written by this guy called Barry Gray. Um, you know, do you want to have a bash at, at like, kind of remixing it? Because, you know, you're into your synths and you do all this this DJ stuff. So I'm like, yeah, right. So um, I bashed together this um, this tune, remixing this uh, this um, TV theme. Uh, so it was a show from the '60s uh, called Thunderbirds. I'll go. It was all like puppets. Um, okay. But it was kind of cool because it was like um, special. The special effects. The guys went on to do James Bond and all sorts of stuff in Shepperton. Um, but the, so it was like cool music, cool effects, and these cars, you know, blowing up and rockets blowing up. But it was all like real life sci-fi visual uh, effects, uh -huh. and um, yeah, so so um, so I just sampled from from the dialogue on that, and and just sort of put together, I guess, what would at the time would have been like a house music uh, theme, and um, that sort of got Can released. Can we hear really that think, anywhere? Um, yeah, it's on YouTube. I mean, if you look up uh, FAB Thunderbirds, I'll go. Um, it's, I'm going to just make a little note of that really quick because I, I want to see that. Um, what it's quite fun because the, uh, yeah, it's called Thunderbirds Argo. Um, and the band is called FAB. Um, All right. you, I think I found it. Something like featuring MC Parker. I found Parker. it. All right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to leave MC that tab Parker. open. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah so, one. so, so it was great because Parker, who was the chauffeur, Lady Penelope's chauffeur in the show. Um, it was the only surviving puppet, so they put headphones and, and some decks with him, oh. <laughs> and, re and he was like with the, with the strings, pretending uh -huh. to play my track. Um, <laughs> so oh that man, I to, can't wait that. For charted. That. I mean, that was back in the night. Was that ninety one? I think it was. So okay. that went, went went up to number five, I think, in the in the British charts. So so by today's standards, that's that was quite quite a major thing. Um, so that kind of launched me as a kind of remix DJ sort of artist. Um, and I did a lot of, I did a bit of that, but, but the main money really was just doing ads for people, yeah. you know, music okay. for ads. I did a film as well. Um, so you then, got into this stuff early. Yeah. I mean, by 23 or so, I was, I was a professional um, music producer. I had my own uh, recording studio just wow. over the road down there. Um, uh -oh. Tons of gear. Uh, well, I say tons of gear. I mean, the thing is, it's so so different now. It was really expensive to own gear. So I would go like down to the local, uh, what was it called, the Music and Video Exchange, and just buy secondhand. There were a lot of old synths that were coming up secondhand. Mm -hmm. Like I got a Moog Prodigy for forty pounds. Wow. Uh, I got a Pro One, which you have behind you. Yeah. I picked one up for about a hundred pounds or something. Um, an SH one hundred and one. Uh, no, I sold them all. I sold them all. I had an, I had an SH one hundred and one. Uh, which I bought pretty much the day it came out from the London okay. Rock Shop. Um, 
Jack 3P, and then people would lend you stuff. You know, when you've got a nice studio, I had an ARP 2600 set in my studio. So that was nice. my first experience of kind of semi modular um, synths. Okay. Um, whole... I just got the Future Retro 777. I think that's supposed to kind of be an SH101. It's not like a clone, but like something that's, yeah. that's supposed to do something similar. It was super a, it was a great based. synth, had a little yeah. sequencer in it, and it just mm-hmm. had this really kind of smooth sound, which the Pro One and the Prodigy didn't. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I sold them all. I sold them all. I had um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's also into restoring synths, and he was talking about recapping, buying these things, uh, putting new capacitors in them because the old capacitors mm-hmm. would leak and blow up. And, mm-hmm. and I just thought, I just thought, fuck that. I am, I'm just getting rid of these things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and also I was moving house a lot and they were taking up a lot of space. So I just yeah. shifted them, you know, it's like, yeah, I've got 300 quid for an SH 101. That's pretty much, you know, double what I paid for it. Um, which today sounds funny because you could, you know, pretty much stick another naught on the end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't regret it. I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm okay with it. I've, I much prefer, um, modern sense. I don't mind if they're a bit digital, um, mm-hmm. and, and with the modular C now you can buy effectively the same kind of stuff, but it's newer. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so, so, and, and therefore more reliable, uh, you know, if you're yeah. using it, um, in, in, um, in, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of studio situation. Yeah. So, so yeah, I got into modular, um, a few years later, I sold my studio, I uh, got into computer graphics. I made a, a little short film, little animated film called Hoverbike, uh, also on YouTube. Um, and okay. I did, did like, so I learned how to do uh, computer animation. So I made a film. I did all the, of course, I did all the sound effects. I did all the um, uh, the, the music soundtrack for it. And um, and that, I again, that, that just sort of launched me into the CGI business. So next thing I knew, I was working on Troy, which is a Brad Pitt film, you know. Oh, yeah, set in yeah. The, the kind of, yeah, um, I was doing like a thousand ships on the beach scene, um, uh-huh. all in CGI with a whole team of people. So that was great because the music by that time was kind of dried up. You know, it's a difficult, quite a difficult business to make mm-hmm. a living in. And as you get older, it gets kind of tougher in many ways. Um, and, um, you know, I have passion. I had these passions. I had two passions when I, um, when I grew up, I was like big into synthesizers and I was big into kind of films and, and effects, basically mm-hmm. Thunderbirds. I'd watched as a kid, you know, I, I love to see things blow up, all those kind of uh-huh. boyish yeah. things. And I, I love <laughs> to make all the noises and the sounds. So that's all I've been doing really. So getting man, back to the circle. Right after, yeah, yeah, man after my own heart. I'm the same. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, I, I'm beginning to think maybe it's some sort of gene that, 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 <laughs> yeah, that we right. all share, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, then, uh, then I kind of got done with, computer graphics. Um, I just felt it was just, you know, it was hard work, basically. I kind yeah. of got a bit burnt out again. Yeah. Um, so then I set up my own company, uh, still doing computer graphics, but I was doing product images. So that's like um, images mm-hmm. of people's sofas or um, any, any product, a clock, a watch, you know, you name it. And we do it mm-hmm. all in CGI, make it look nice and pretty. Um, and, then, um, and then COVID happened. And... Um, and I thought, well, I've been meaning to sort of make my own module. Uh, maybe now's a good time. And uh, I, I was getting a bit tired with my product image business. I was getting a bit tired of making these beautiful images for people and seeing them launch their product. And then they'd come back a year later, you know, driving a Porsche or something. It's like, yeah, Chase, you know, we've got a bit more budget this time. And like, yeah, yeah. Fucking hell, I want a piece of the action. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got into modular. <laughs> so, I got, so I got into modular. I thought, well, if I'm going to make one of my own, maybe I'll just make a few extra and I'll sell it to, to mm-hmm. just to pay back the costs, you know, because yeah, as totally. we all know, it's quite an expensive hobby. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I did a nice looking website. Um, made this, this module, I think I'd made two. No, I hadn't. I just made one and I was using, I did a little video of me playing it. And it's still on, that's on YouTube again, like 20,000 views now, I think. And, um, Molten Music. Was this the Poly Cinematic? This was the Poly Cinematic. Wow, this was okay. Cinematic. That was your first really? module. Yeah. Molten Music got hold of it. And, um, Robin, he did a whole, uh, review of it. And mm-hmm. was talking about, you know, Nobula this and this, this this great new module and it's got how many oscillators? Fifty-six oscillators and 
all this sort of stuff. And I think I just suddenly realized, one, I didn't realize that I built something that everybody else wanted. And mm-hmm. two, that in doing so, I'd suddenly have to form a nobular into a company and start yeah. knocking this. So, so, uh, so that's what I did. So I, I was, you know, bashed out. Um, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, I was like saying, "How many? How many do you think I should make? Should I do a hundred? Should I do like hundred? And they were like, "No, no, no! You know, you, you do, do, do like two fifty, <laughs> yeah. do two fifty, and uh, just went on from um, there." So I think yeah, I, the I, sales are like fifteen hundred. I think now. Yeah, so. that's that's amazing. I want to so get. I want to put a pin in that real quick, just because uh, I think you'll appreciate this story. Before this is before I got into modular, but yeah. there was this um, this uh, concert series in Seattle. Um, by the Northwest Film Forum. They called it Puget Soundtrack because we have the Puget Sound. And basically they would invite um, an, like an electronic artist from the area um, to pick a movie of their choice to fully rescore. And then the idea was they would put it on mute and then you would play the, the score live for an audience. And... I uh, I wanted to do the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger because I just loved it so much as a kid. And um, I happened to have a friend that was working at uh, London Bridge Studio where a bunch of the famous like 90s grunge albums are recorded. Yeah. Um, and he uh, one of his like coworkers there was uh, was a Foley guy. Um, so we found some local comedians and we went into the studio and we redid all of the dialogue with our, like we found somebody who could do an Arnold and we just had all these different voices. And then we had a guy do all the Foley and then I rescored it. And so rather than putting it on mute, like every other one in the past, we had actually had the full film with new Foley, new dialogue, new and dialogue. then we played it live. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a copy of it. It's it's just gone. I don't know how or why, but um, yeah, that was like. So how did you sync it to the to the movie? Or did you just like press play burned, at the same time? We or? made our own copy of the movie with with the, so, um, and we were also playing to some backing tracks because it was you know I did the yeah. score and then I had the guy who who was the studio guy who was helping me on stage. He was doing some percussion. Had like a water phone and. Um, an OP one. Um, <laughs> so we, we yeah. basically just ripped a copy of the movie with like our backing tracks and our new sound effects and our new, uh, dialogue. And then, oh, and just then just play, play live on top. That. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That was the night I think my wife fell in love with me. That was only the second time we'd ever really like ever hung out and she came out and, and luckily I, I say That's I, great. I so all the, maybe peaked that night, but yeah, <laughs> you hit peak modular. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, that, I just thought that was funny. Cause uh, you know, you're saying you did fully and stuff. That's hard work and it takes a lot. Like we put so much work into that. Um, it's it an, it's an amazing craft because mm-hmm. uh, you can really change a scene. With oh yeah. Sound effects uh, yeah. And, and what you do with it. Um, yeah. It's, it's a, there's a real art to art to what you put in and what you take out what you yeah. don't bother with. Um, I mean, when I started, it was, uh, we used to have 24 track tape recorders, um, synchronized to, um, like umatic tape, video tape recorder. So mm-hmm. every time you did a take, you'd have to rewind like back 20, 20 seconds you'd and then play and then and it would, it would all, everything would synchronize together with the computer and uh-huh. then you'd wait. And you go, okay, go. Uh, uh-huh. and, and if you missed it, it's like, oh, Christ, you know, go back again. <laughs> oh, this also yeah. makes me think. Yeah. I got to ask before we move on to, like, have you ever heard of this movie called uh, Barbarian Sound Studio? No. I'm going to I'm gonna put it in our little chat here because yes. it, do you like, I mean, you like film. Um, do you like kind of surreal, almost bordering on, ho- not horror, but kind of creepy I like um, unusual stuff. I mean, I love the okay. I don't, I, anything and, that's feature length. I, what I what I don't. Oh, you don't everyone, like everyone who knows length? me. No, I love feature length. Oh, okay, um, okay. Um, well, everyone who knows me knows that I don't like episodal. Um, yeah, but I, I do like the format, the one and a half, two hour format of. Um, okay. Of, uh, of yeah, feature length. I just sent you the name of the album, uh, the the name of the film. So it's about a guy who does. He's doing um, fully for the this like weird witchy horror movie, and it just goes really surreal. And it's it's a it's a sound designer slash you know film film mm. nerd like smorgasbord. 
Um, and this guy's a great director. It's uh, Peter Strickland. He's done a bunch of really, really odd and but awesome movies. Um, but back to Nobula. So that's I. I didn't. I didn't pick that that aspect of it up, or didn't really lock it into memory when we were talking last. That I knew that you had made. You kind of were taking the um, the approach that I think a lot of budding mad- manufacturers take of like, uh, oh, I'll build a couple to sell that way I can afford to like do this and yeah. then, you know, that'll be cool. And, uh, I love that you just kind of did that and happened to create something because yeah, the, the polyphony thing, um, has been just the, I feel like it, it a lot of people are after it. A lot of people, there's so many different ways to go about it in modular. Yeah, there are, Some a there little are. more clunky than others or, or maybe well, I mean, characterful. The, 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 I suppose the one that that was being pursued. I don't know if, how many people are still doing it, but the you know, the idea of having four filter modules, four oscillator modules, four envelope modules, and my friend David does that. Up, you know, and yeah. I, and you know, I guess each to his own. It's a very it's a very broad church uh, mm-hmm. modular, and, and um, that's kind of what I what appeals to me about it. You can basically mm-hmm. do anything, and yeah, you know, it's just accepted. Uh, you can. You know, it's a very experimental area but for me personally you know it's a very personal um thing polycinematic and i think that's that's often the case with any kind of work of art even if it's like a a a hit single or a you know any kind of piece of art or something it you just it goes through you you just do what you think is felt good at the time Uh um if i think if anyone tries to make great music or great art thinking about how successful it's going to be at the end of it or thinking how it's going to f- sort of be the next big thing. It, it never works. You just have to do it yeah. from your from your heart and just think, well, I, I just want it to be like this for me and it kind of feels right. And if anyone mm-hmm. else is interested in it, then then that's great. Of course, the second when it comes to the second module and the third module, <laughs> all that goes yeah. out the window because yeah. now it's yeah, like, yeah. Shit, I've, got, I've got like a business now and I've got, I've uh-huh. got a super booth <laughs> and I've got to take something with me that no one's heard of or seen. So, I mean, fortunately, I've been away from music long enough to have a, a big backlog of gear that I've always yeah. dreamt of making or inventing or owning, mm-hmm. um, which is another good thing to have. You know, I spent um, about, I think, after I sold my studio, I think I spent 10 years. I didn't even touch a keyboard and I didn't play a piano for nearly really? 10 years. And it was only when my, and I'd started a family at this time. So when the kids were sort of, of, of sort of age where they were getting into music, I bought them um, a little Yamaha piano. Mm-hmm. And of course I started playing it myself. Right. And then yeah. slowly music started to, to come back in, in my life. But I'd been, I'd been so burnt, burnt out in the yeah, 90s, but I just was like, I can't like, go back there. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so, uh, so now I am back there. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, well, I want to just say that, uh, when we, when we had met, um, you know, on our, on our little, our, our kind of five minute meeting that turned into an hour and a half, you know, just hang session, which was really fun. Um, I hadn't tried poly cinematic yet, nor had I tried chord pilot yet and now i have so i can't wait to like so, dive yeah, into should... my my feelings on those and everything um but i also want to just say like it's funny to hear you talk about like your first synths and like you know you men- mentioned uh jean-michel jarre yeah and i feel like okay well i could like the poly cinematic is just making so much more and more sense as you're kind of describing your journey through synthesizers and what what kind of pulled you in because the poly cinematic has this very like uh i mean you can get all sorts of different sounds on it as we'll talk about in a moment but like you can get that classic just 80s sci-fi or 80s kind of like um you know jean-michel jarre you know van vangelis yeah, like i mean that it's got kind a, of sound. a notch the, the notch filter setting on it has that kind of space age yeah um, so Jean-Michel good jarre feeling about it which are, yeah I, I like those kind of twin dual pole filter kind of sounds um mm-hmm. you get or it's kind of phaser sound i guess yeah um i mean the the, the basis of the polycinematic to be honest was was uh the sh101 it was mm-hmm. the, the sh101 there okay. was the simplicity of that synth and that it made certain um kind of savings like it only had one envelope but you know you could 
push that some of that into the filter. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't uh, over designed. It was really quite. It's quite a minimal synth, mm-hmm. and um, the problem since those days, where everything's gone digital, uh, is that we've added in all these extra controls to the point where you now have to have presets. So, so now instead of just using a synth. You find yourself just skimming through presets. Mm-hmm. Do I want that one? Do I like that one? Do I like that one? Which just sort of took the fun out mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. So, so the the, the polysynthetic was deliberately simple, um, and I was trying to get just a, a nice sounding pad style polysynth in twelve HP with yeah. no presets. That was really my brief for myself because I had I had this, um, which is um, the access bar. So my, my modular setup um, was like more or less what you can see behind me there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had this, which is, the, I mean, it's lovely. Access for oh, yeah. 16. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Voice, okay, okay. Uh, 16 parts. Um, and so I was just trying to minimize that. I realized that all I was using on the, the virus was um, like the kind of string sound. The, uh, and the, I've uh, noticed super that too. Sound. I've noticed that Anytime I've had like a big, super robust synth that can do anything, like, you know, like say the Novation Summit, amazing yeah. synth, so much cool stuff. But, and I've noticed this on other synths, I'll go into like my, my saved bank of voices that I'll make and I'll go through them and I'm like, oh, these are all, I'm kind of making the same voice over and over again. Yeah, you're, all you're doing is getting is. basic oscillator settings. And, yeah, then, and yeah. then you just go straight for the filter <laughs> frequency. And yeah. You make the attack and decay, and that's it. You know, three three things. So so I suppose I was really just playing on on, on that, that idea. Uh, of well, so that's things really simple. I think I, think I saw in, because, uh, you know, you, you had mentioned you sent them out to me. So I, I started, you know, watching slash listening to YouTube demos and just kind of, I like to just kind of get, get a, a rough idea of what's going on. So when yeah. it gets here, I can just start, you know, messing around. And, <clears throat> and I, I can see how, so I don't know who it was and it wasn't really a complaint. It was just kind of more something they had mentioned like, oh, I kind of wish you could address, you know, this kind of stuff via CV. But then it's like, okay, well, then it would be like four times as big. And I like that, like, you can you can get a lot of, it has a lot of range, but that range you're exploring with an envelope depth filter, what, uh, you know, three three switches, what kind of filter do you want? And then your, uh, your three different kind of combinations of uh, oscillators and waveforms mixed yeah. with like their own like type each one that you've kind of just like okay here's how they get kind of one through three on this little switch get a, like progressively a little crunchier maybe is yeah. maybe not the best word but um and i could see how within the world of modular you could be like well what's the point of having the module if you can't but like everything's so like digitally yeah. controlled uh analog it's it's like we've 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 definitely passed the point in modular of like, I think as from a design and a use case where we've passed the point, not passed the point where like, it's just evolved. It's not just like, we just want all, we want to make every single drum and snare like hit, like well, high hat d- hit. Depends you what know. your, your kind of end, end game is for, really with, with yeah, modular. For I think sure. when it first started, it, it was very much like, well, it's a deconstructed synthesizer, isn't it? Instead of mm-hmm. having it all built in, which is sort of what the synth, the modular synth started as a modular synth. It was only the mm-hmm. mini mode that started making it into more right. of an instrument. Um, so I, th- I think it was inevitable uh, that modular synths would start to converge uh, into modules that did, uh, well, at least, yeah, that did more than just uh, one thing. Right. Uh, you yeah. take uh, Platts, for example, you know, you can use it. Mm-hmm. On its completely on its own, it's sort of got an envelope shaper in it, uh, and uh, you know it's sort of self-contained. But it's got lots of variety. You can pick different algorithms and, and just go from there. But the, uh-huh. I suppose the thing is with, with certainly with my modular is is you know I could build a synth out of an oscillator filter and an envelope. That's great, but that's all that's used up all my HP. Uh-huh. You know, 
And now, because I'm use, I use it more like a groove box. So mm-hmm. now I need space for my drums. I need the sequencer uh, and all the effects. So I haven't really got the space to have, you know, one of those kind of wall to wall systems. And I think even if I did have the space, I'd find it so confusing. I get in such a muddle. Um, I have a huge you know. case right here. Actually, I'll show you. Um, I've got that guy, and it's a beautiful Needham Woodworks case. It's absolutely gorgeous, and. Um, I'm just, I constantly am bringing stuff with me. Like portability is kind of like, you know, that's kind of, I, I'd, I'd say that underscores like my work because I go camping a lot. I like to make, you know, these ro- remote performance films. Plus with being in the position that I'm at, which is a lucky position. So this isn't a complaint, but I get sent stuff to learn how to use and then, you know, film using it or make music with it and talk about it. So uh, I'm constantly like, couple times a week rearranging what's in yeah. my case. So I actually have these, um, the 4MS pods, I have four of them. And that way I can just yeah, like, same. if I need, you know, I just like, I can make the size synth that I want. Okay, this is the size synth that I want to bring on the airplane and mess with. Or yeah, I mean, we use them a lot on, um, when we yeah. go to shows. When Perfect. we go to shows, yeah. we don't want to, because I think people find it overwhelming to, to yeah. see like a massive synth. Um, I feel really it, like all you want to, yeah. you just want to demo one, uh, you know, it's, it's just overwhelming to see everything else. So, yeah. so we use them a lot, but actually I've started using them as like, you know, I have my bath synth module uh, yeah. and my, my drumming module it. and you, and you stick them all together into a, into a bigger synth. So it's, it's sort of, a, yeah, sort of I a do different too. approach. There's so like many different approaches to, to module. Yeah. It's like no one, no one builds a recording studio the same way. Uh, right, exactly. Uh, yeah, everyone everyone has their own kind of um, application. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, but I have had to- this full and like have patched on it. Uh, something I yeah. noticed there was a, there was a there was a um, there was an inverse relationship. I felt early. It's probably a lack of experience too. But as my system got bigger, I felt like the the coherency and just listenability for lack of a better yeah. word of my music went down. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I th- it's like, I remember the, the best tune I ever did in my studio was when I had a, just a Tascam two, four, four, four track cassette. Mm-hmm. And I, and I just, it was just so simple. And I knew it back to front, which is another really important thing. Very, it's just knowing yeah. how your gear works. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew it back to front. And, and so I was, you, I'm kind of in that flow state making mm-hmm. music. I'm not having to worry about, where things go and what happens next. You're just doing uh-huh. it. And um, yeah, so simple, that go, does go a long way. I mean, of course, when it comes to recording things properly, there's always going to be an engineer that says, well, we need separate outputs from that drum machine and we need to yeah. record this separately. And then it's just like a little bubble. It pops and, and you can't really, you know, in a different, completely different space. Yeah, totally. I want to go back just because um, – I can see myself as a podcast listener being like, oh, they were talking about something cool and then Tim interrupted and they haven't got back to it. <laughs> um, but so you you made, you're, you're to the point where you've made this, you've made polycinematic and now somebody's done a video about it. And now uh, if somebody at a shop was telling you, you should make more yeah, of Yeah, I had, um, I had, this is the, this was the, the serendipity of it all, I suppose, was that Vince at Molten Music, sorry, I'm, yeah, um, we. I, I I did the first video, so I released a video of me playing, it. and then Robin Vince at Malta Music, um, uh-huh. he did a little, little um, piece. I can't have him on. Was it's... it Music Rad- Radar? Yeah, he's lovely. He's a lovely, lovely guy. Um, he does Synth East, um, mm-hmm. which is a one of these kind of little British um, sort of meetings, synth meetings. Okay. And that seems to be getting some traction now, and that's how in. Um, in Norfolk, a lot of people when I say oh, I'm doing synth east, they're like, "Oh, where are you going? Like, like, um, you know, Tokyo?" Or no, <laughs> no, I'm going to to Norwich. Um, in, <laughs> in east, uh, it's not very glamorous, um, but uh, but yeah. Um, so he he did a piece about it on Music Radar. I don't know, maybe it was quiet that week or something, or maybe it just piqued his interest because at the time it was it, well, even now it's still kind of unique, a unique product. Um, and then I, I was on holiday at the time and, and I said to my wife, I said, something weird's happening. I'm getting all these messages from people saying, where can I get this? Where, where can I buy it? Um, and I said, it's that, I just, I just tagged this guy 
on Instagram and now I'm getting all these messages. It's mad. <laughs> it was, it was insane. Uh, it was just one of, you know, occasionally have these moments in life when, you know, cool things happen. Like when you meet your wife or, you know, just yeah, when, yeah. when and the it's planets never when align and it, yeah, you're, not trying, looks, you're no. not trying for it. Yeah. So, so it just landed in my lap like that. But yeah, I think I, I think I, the, I got something right with it really that other people also wanted something. And, and also I think it was, I wasn't afraid to use MIDI. I think there's a lot of URAC, a kind of anti MIDI. A lot of URAC is kind of anti, um, condensing everything into one voice. I mean, I've, I've had people come up to me at shows and say, you're cheating, you know, literally it's like, what would you mean? I'm cheating. Um, Show me the rule book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> where is this? Where is this rule book that's, that you've written for yourself? Yeah. Usually, it's people who have graduated from engineering school or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Audio yeah. engineering. Um, they have these sort of ideas well, which they, you know, they it's need like to it, sort does of it work have through. to be? Does it have to be like? Uh, does it have to be an arduous prog process? Like at every turn. In modular, is that what keeps it like for like for yeah, for, this, have to be for this hypothetical yeah. purist that we're mm. like, which I haven't really encountered, so they may not totally exist, but or at least not in droves. But yeah, like okay, well, they have, we have MIDI to CV converters. So, yeah. do you want me to use one of those? Because I will say one of the this was this is something that like gave me you know I had a an out loud chortle, I, a literal LOL. Um, when I was like, wait, so I can just plug this MIDI controller directly into this and then I'll just have polyphony just like that? Like, I was like, this, there's got to be some steps. And I did it. Nope, that's that's all you have to do. Oh, is this with, like, <laughs> with Chord Pilot? With Chord Pilot and Polycinematic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah, just yeah. like, oh, okay, whoa. Um, I, I instantly got a hold of my friend David Lutz, who, you know, he likes the process. He has three Dixies from IntelliGel, which are just great just multi, you know, they're just great analog oscillators. Uh, I believe they're analog. I'm almost positive. They're great oscillators, but they're, you know, they're just, you know, pretty simple oscillators. Yeah. And that's how he makes all his chords. And I sent him a video and I'm like, look, just like I'm playing a chord right <laughs> now. And, and he's like one of the, he, he's like, oh, you know, like, do I want that? Or do I like, you know, it's like he likes the process, but also like, oh, that would be pretty easy to, use and yeah yeah i mean because because my my take on the midi side of it really is I, I what i hate about midi is midi channels um yeah i mean probably cinematic you can tune it into a particular midi channel but it, by default it's in omni so it'll just play everything you know that horrible situation you get when you plug midi in and it's like why is it playing the kind of drums on the low half of the keyboard you know um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, but I, I, I sort of think MIDI, it's not, it's not the fastest interface in the world. So don't, don't give it any more than it has to, to, yeah, to yeah. deal with sort of thing. So I, I, I like the idea that, um, you, you know, the, the patch cable that, that comes with actually both polycinematic and core pilot, the, the core pilot one actually looks like a regular patch cable. It's just a stereo TRS cable. Yeah. yeah. I'm holding it up right now yeah. for those uh, watching um, or for and those it's listening. Really, it's really nice when you just patch it in and it works. Yeah. Um, there's <laughs> yeah. not that thing of like, oh, there's no sound coming out and playing around with the, am I sending it the right MIDI channel? Or oh, yeah, the other, I, the other one that I mentioned where the drums play as well. Right. Um, I do want to show you this. So I have a bunch of um, patch cables that are quite literally like the exact, like they have yes. to be the same manufacturer. However, they yeah. are, they're like one centimeter shorter and they're, you know, just the regular. So this thing, like I have to, I have to keep an eye yeah. on, on your um, TRS one. Well, I, 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 it does, it does also say Nobula on the, on the plug. It does. Yeah. yeah. But um, I, I've made that mistake myself and I have, <laughs> I, <laughs> it was from the same manufacturer. It was actually one of their demo chords uh, that okay. they sent me. And uh, it's, um, it has a knot. I've tied a knot in it to okay, remind yeah. me that it's mono and I and it doesn't work with MIDI. And I, every now and then I get, I'll get an email from someone saying, Oh, the MIDI on my core pilot stopped working. And I, have you checked? Did it? Either, yeah. yeah. Did oh yeah. It? I'm really sorry. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> not, it's a mono patch cable. So there is that. But, um, yeah. And the other thing of course is, is a lot of people, um, 
in Eurac, don't don't use keyboards at all. I mean, that's why that's mm -hmm. why I made Core Pilot for people yeah. who don't do keyboards really. Um, but the it was when I was using Platts. You know, Platts has a I don't know if you know it the the um, Mutable Instruments oscillator. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a mode on it, uh, a chord mode where mm -hmm. you can like one voltage controls the pitch and one voltage controls the chord like inversions and stuff yeah, yeah major minor you know mm -hmm. seventh all that sort of stuff um which is great which is great so i i kind of had i built poly cinematic where i was prototyping it and i thought oh it'd be nice if you could just do a bit more over cv like you can with the platz device and i thought well i could put in a minor chord i could program in a major chord and i thought well this is done why don't i just make it so that the midi programs the chords for you so that was the the kind of thinking behind the the chord select feature in mm -hmm. poly cinematic was was that you can play it like just as an oscillator you can use it just as a, just as a as a in fact i've noticed a couple of stores do call it the poly cinematic oscillator um and um but if you connect a midi keyboard or a core pilot um you can play in a major chord or, or just any other, any, anything you can think of on the keyboard and it will memorize it. Uh, mm -hmm. It memorizes up to eight. Uh, and those eight chords, of course, are accessible through a voltage. So that was the kind of thinking behind it. It's like, well, let's just do polyphony like you do on plats. You have a voltage for the chord uh, and a voltage for the pitch. And, mm -hmm. um, and so there are quite a lot of, so I'm surprised how many people have polycinematics who, do, who just use it with CV and gate. They don't, they don't have a yeah, MIDI keyboard. Yeah, I can see that, especially like you said, with the Chord Pilot, like that thing. Yeah. I'm still, I haven't like totally wrapped my, I always No, like I mean, the Chord Pilot takes takes it back a step further. The, so the yeah. Chord Pilot has voltages that, that allow you to design the chord and it's deliberately done uh, so that it doesn't give you a major minor option. It doesn't allow you to invert or it's not it's it's not based on straightforward musical theory or mm -hmm. nomen culture nomen culture nomen yeah it doesn't use the names that are mm -hmm. given for the, what it what it what it does is it has controls uh, for how far apart the notes are uh, and how clustered they are at one end of the chord to the other how, how many mm -hmm. notes those sort of things um and um so it's a kind of quite a novel way of creating a chord slightly yeah. slightly naive um but nonetheless it, it produces really interesting results i you think get, yeah you know. something like that is kind of that that you could describe as slightly naive in this in this on um you know in this topic of conversation or this this type of gear it, like i think that that is something that provides people the 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 kind of stumbling blocks maybe that like put you into a new you know, new territory that you weren't expecting to be in, but you're like, oh, you know, those happy accidents yeah. that modular are so yeah, exactly. good at creating. It's so like, good at because there's no mouse. You're not you're not restricted by a mouse and keyboard. So mm -hmm. happy accidents is what it's all about. And I think like before, you know, to somebody listening, you know, before we got to this point of the the talk and talking about chord pilot, I think like, or even if you told me, just hey, there's this this. This oscillator, but you wouldn't really call it an oscillator because it has the filter and envelope and and all this, and you could just plug a MIDI keyboard into it. Like I would, I would that would lend me or tend. I would tend to think like maybe that's not the best type of instrument for like the happy accident type of modular thing. But that would be totally wrong because of you know like also i feel like what what you have from the unison to fifth all, all the way to octave yes yeah the space in between those on that knob yeah, yeah. cuz you have this knob this like you can get into some wild wild stuff that's really really fucking cool sounding so it's yeah, yeah you've especially done a, with a the fantastic reverb. job yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you ping the reverb with those kind of midway tunings and lots mm -hmm. of resonance and stuff and it just becomes well i mean it can become anything but you know you can start gazing it and you know, just little additions I've done since I've released it. Like if you turn the release to maximum, it it just goes into hold, so yeah. you can have it a permanently on oscillator. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, and then you can build it into. People do they build them into bigger patches? Um, yeah, and stick yeah, a, you can, and and that way you can use top. your own filter and your own envelope and VCA if you want. Yeah, which but. which goes back to the to the kind of is it cheating 
uh, idea where you can, you know, you can set it up, treat it as an oscillator, and and set it up just as your saw sound, and uh-huh. then you can get gate it, envelope, and do all that business afterwards mm-hmm. as part of your modular synthesizer. So yeah, and yeah. it has the one volt per octave in too, so you wouldn't have you don't have to use it with MIDI if you don't want. Like you can no. do it the a harder way if you'd like. <laughs> you can do it harder. Well, I mean, there are there are some nice things about um, one volt per octave. Which I do yeah. do like you know if you're getting into sliding notes and and mm-hmm. micro tunings. I mean, there's a right. bit of there's a bit of micro tuning on it. I, it's something I've recently got big into. Uh, and a lot of people, when you say micro tuning, they think, oh, you mean like sort of doing sort of weird Moroccan scales and stuff like that. It's like no, this is just doing. Um, what I was a kind of te- technically harmon- harmonic scale or just mm-hmm. just tuning because the tuning e- equal temperament and this goes back to my experience as a thirteen year old building this big fat poly well it wasn't I wouldn't call it polysynth this transcendent DPX kit I built mm-hmm. you know it it was so pu- such a pure tuning and equal temperament that it just didn't really have any life to it so uh, yeah. polycinematic it's it's deliberately sort of slightly cranked to the left a bit um it's the tuning isn't as quite as you expect i mean it can be you can you can set it up so mm-hmm. it's as as in tune as say juno 60 um but it's actually because because juno 60 has uh, dcos right has digital oscillators um and uh but polycinematic uh, by default is not 100 percent just tuned it's just somewhere in between so, so were, just, you t- yeah, were you were you tuning like um like say like two octaves apart were you like were you tuning um some like some of the harmonics to each other rather than the actual like um the primary wave of of whatever uh well kind of I, my two, friend two things a, going on with it yeah Go on. okay my friend's that a does, piano tuner and he's explained explained in yes. the equal temperament and how like you can't tune you literally cannot tune a piano like to full equal temperament and if you did it would sound awful because the harmonic series starts like getting out as you get like further yes. like the octaves yeah. get further well, away from each other equal other. temperament is is um that's the kind of compromise just just tuning uh is 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 done harmonically and that yeah that's how piano tuners certainly used to tune where you'd like right, you'd play right. a, yeah, you play a fifth and you could hear it ring you could hear the the, the next note ring because it was a harmonic of it um mm-hmm. and if you tuned it like that it would sound great as long as you only played the white notes, yeah. Then yeah, as soon yeah. as you started, as soon as you played, I think it's, if you played like a C sharp major, it was awful. You get this thing they called the wolf tone, which back in the day was sort of considered evil. Uh-huh. Um, so you know that that's understandable. Um, now we've got this this kind of compromised tuning where you can play in any key and it will always sound the same. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're playing with a saxophone player or something like that, then they're having to do the compensate. Cause right, because they they can bend or the, whatever. Yeah, like, but naturally, like the trumpet is is doing a harmonic. It's doing a, a, a pure fifth. It's not an equal temperament fifth. Anyway, it get it very quickly gets very confusing. But the, yeah, the, yeah. The, I the mean, long and short of the story is um, the with with this micro tuned keyboard, um, it does two things. One is it stretches the octaves, which your tuner friend might have mentioned. Um, and what that means is when you play, you know, when you if you play an octave on a keyboard, like the mm-hmm. octave above, um, like that, you can hear <laughs> you can hear it's two notes because the two notes are ringing yep. between. Well, actually, that's six strings, but but you can hear hear the ringing between the two octaves. Actually, this is t- that was just two strings because this is a an a una corda. My friend, my friend, piano tuner. We, me and him went and picked this up. This was free, oh, and we nice. wanted to make an unicorda. So, for those listening, so you, took, you took the two strings off, or is yeah, it like each, a, every key has one string only? So you've you've, you've taken the strings out. Mm-hmm. Well, he did. Nice. I didn't. He's he's yeah, like yeah. a he's like a genius. He can do anything. Oh, nice. uh, he used to build he used to build uh, pipes for pipe organs for years. Yes, like we have this. Oh, lovely you know all pipe. about the tuning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is he's a real smart guy. So um so yeah the um. You know the polycinematic stretches the octaves, so when it when it detects that you're playing an octave, I mean by I mean detect it, it's listening to what you're playing over MIDI, and if it hears that you're playing an octave above, it just sharpens, it just stretches it slightly, um, and it means that instead of getting 
that kind of pure single note sound, you get a slight phasing uh-huh. between uh-huh. the octave. Um, and then it's doing something similar with the with the fifth. It's 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 bringing it. I can't remember which way it's bending it, but it's it's making it closer to a perfect just uh-huh. fifth. Um, just things like that. So when you when you play, and it's adjustable as well. You hold shift and detune, um, and it will take you through different tunings. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the I suppose the upshot of that is particularly when you're playing single oscillator sounds, um, which is quite difficult on polycinematic. But you can do it um, when you're playing single oscillator sounds. It just gives chords this this kind of richness. It's difficult to describe. It's like have you ever played a fifth uh, chord on a guitar like really mm-hmm. fuzzy um oh yeah it's that kind of it, the, the the notes just lock in um and they don't do it on a keyboard um i think on a guitar it's something to do with is it the the bridge the the, the notes tend to lock themselves into the harmonic so you get a perfectly tuned fifth. <sighs> you I'm, know i'm, I'm not, not gonna, sure yeah, i'm not gonna go into yeah. it it's the sort of thing where Someone who knows more than me is going to write in and go, "Well, actually, Jason, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's yeah, the internet, the land of well, actually, yeah. <laughs> fine, you know." Um, but uh, you know, I've, I sort of do the theory and then I program it into the synth, and I sort of forget the details mm-hmm. uh, three years later. But yeah, something really into so so the the micro tuning comes as standard on polycinematic, um, okay. which again is a nice thing because that's what I hate about MIDI, um, apart from MIDI channels. Um, I hate the, the fact that uh, most synths are, are digitally controlled oscillators. I mean, polycinematic is completely digital, but there's quite a lot of things I've done to make it undigital with the mm-hmm. tuning. Um, yeah, yeah. No presets. So it forces you into a into an analog way of working, and it yeah. has a kind of analog sound to it. Totally, yeah. Yeah, um, it sounds great. So, yeah. Um, it's funny, we're we're – 50 minutes into our hour long episode and we've just talked about polycinematic which is yeah. i think a testament to how cool this thing is um and we don't have you know i, I don't want to take up too much of your time but also we don't have to cut it short right in an hour but i do want to allow you some time to talk about um your other modules because you have uh, a handful of them and we got to talk about yes. your little piano case behind you for <laughs> those of you just listening uh, well, you'll hear about that soon. But. Yeah. So the piano case. I mean, it's it's that I um, that was pure pianophonic. So pianophonic um, is the kind of follow up polyphonic module to um, polycinematic, if you like. And and really, again, for me, it was just trying to fill a hole in my rack that where I needed something that wasn't so much a pad but more of a percussive uh, piano-y type of module and the 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 idea behind it was um what if we had a wavetable synthesizer um where we sampled wavetables of pianos much like the the old uh, was it the korg um one um mm-hmm. d50 i think did it to some extent i wanted that sort of 90s um piano house piano sound um i didn't want the kind of big fat plug-in piano sound Mm -hmm. why because i think i found with all my piano samples um that the the sound from the sample was always a bit it was so like a piano um i wanted something that was sort of almost more towards a synth sound Mm -hmm. and therefore a bit more controllable if you if you're doing as part of a, a, a bigger mix and you're using a piano kind of chompy piano sound sometimes just having playing back a sample over and over again doesn't sound so great. So yeah, yeah so we did a wave. Piano is also hard to mix with other instruments. I found because it kind yeah. of occupies every single frequency like range. Um, well, they they do particularly um, the hammers and the low frequencies. You know, they, mm-hmm. you just get this kind of thumping sound, which makes the bass really muddy. So yeah, so that so that that so the brief really was with that was to have a triple wave table oscillator synth. Um, and to have a separate hammer sound, which was effectively a, a sample. So that's uh-huh. four um, playback engines per voice, eight voices. And then the same things, the, 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 the reverb, um, the filter. Well, the filter, we put a kind of DJ filter on it. So you can, you can kind of muffle it for more of a kind of uh, felt kind piano of sound. or something. Yeah. Um, and, and you can, or you can lighten it with a high pass 
section of the filter if you want it to be more of a kind of housey sound that doesn't get in the way of the rest of your mix. Because mm-hmm. with a lot mm-hmm. of my modules, you can kind of, you don't need to bring everything into a desk and treat it. You can just bring it all in, you know, to a, to a simple gain only mixer and you should be able to get more or less what you want mm-hmm. from it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, so so three wavetables um, and a sampler, eight, eight voices. And this piano here, this toy piano, um, so cool. I wanted a toy piano sound because you're having conversations with people about, you know, um, what to sample. Someone said, oh, please, Jason, put a, put a felt piano on it and, and stuff. And, um, yeah, somebody said, toy piano. You've got to put a toy piano in it. It was so much fun. So I thought, yeah, let's do that. And, you know, I tried to find samples online and I found them and I didn't really want to get into um, licensing other people's mm-hmm. sounds. And also because I wanted the hammer separately, I, I sort of wanted a bit more control over what I was sampling. So I thought, well, I should, well, you know, how hard can it be to do it myself? So I just went on eBay um, and there was one for sale, just the one I wanted, which is the Brazilian um, one behind behind me, Stradivarius, I think it's called, which is it's not a violin, but that's a Brazilian <laughs> piano, child's piano. Um, and there was one for sale just around the corner, just down the road in London for like 60 pounds, I think I, I bid for it. Um, and I, I took it home. I sampled it. Uh, it was in really good condition. I think it was missing two notes because the way it works is like a tine. It's kind of like an electric piano. It just okay. hits a hits a mm-hmm. rod, and that rod vibrates. It's got a very distinctive sound. So yeah, I sampled it, and you know, brought out pianophonic. And well, I was about to bring out pianophonic. I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? Should I just put it back on eBay? Um, it just seemed a bit of a waste to throw it away. And I'm we live in quite a minimal house so mm-hmm. so no one wants this stuff we don't we don't have a loft or a basement so it's like when you buy something you're kind of stuck with it yeah yeah so um, <laughs> so, so i thought i oh, will um and then i had just had this idea i thought well, why don't i just demo pianophonic in it um by putting i'll put a um a module i don't know how well you can see it from there i can't really get close on it but there are pictures i think on the internet of it in various places but mm. or videos i think i've done of it but yeah, um, so it turned out that when I took out the keyboard that was in there, that uh-huh. the space left behind was exactly the same space as the key step, uh, little sequencer keyboard. So, so that just went straight in its place. And then when I took out the front, the, the actual width uh, was exactly 110 HP. So um, I basically didn't have to cut anything. I just took the front out. Um, and then I, then I got carried away and put, put like a car stereo speakers in the front and, and stuff like that. But, um, it's, well, I've always wanted a freestanding with speakers, with power, with keyboard modular system. So, so that's, that's what I ended up building. Cause I was quite inspired by it. Did you know, Love Halton? Did we talk about that last, last time? He's, he's on, he's on Instagram. He's a Swedish guy called Love Halton and he, he just, he gets commissions to design these extraordinary synths. Um, uh, yeah, so people all sort of say, oh, look, I've got a TR-808 clone or something. Um, can you just make it into some sort of weird device? And he'll sort of make a beautiful cabinet and give it some, you know, black and purple keys and put it on cool little legs and it and it does like a whole photo shoot around it so um yeah pianophonic um i made that um and we showed that so at cool. uh bristronica which is um a british show in bristol it's quite difficult it doesn't travel well that yeah um so when i go to super booth i have a much more minimal setup that all kind of compacts into two suitcases mm-hmm. that thing weighs a ton so i i just stick it in the back of the car um, <laughs> shall I talk about, um, Kikane? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cause I know um, that one I've, I've, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of people, um, talk, there seems to be a lot of buzz about it. Um, yeah, it's, 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 that's the sort of, it's an interesting one, um, that, I mean, when people say, what's your favorite module? I always say Kikane. Oh, really? It, okay. Yeah. Because I think it's. It's not, I mean, I, I, I probably should say polycinematic because it's, it's that's sort of <laughs> what started, um, yeah. you know, but, but to me, 
it's polysomatic was obvious. Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, but cocaine was um, something I'd wanted to do for a long for a long time, and um, I think it was sort of all came about from well, I wanted to do a side chain compressor. I wanted to do a dynamics compressor, and I was using this this Daisy platform, and it only had by standard by standard by default sorry by default it only had two inputs and i well i wanted to stereo inputs and another input for a kick drum that would then get side chained and stuff mm -hmm. um so so then i sort of thought well why don't i just combine it all into one why don't i just do like the ultimate kick drum because i still hadn't found the kick drum module that i wanted to do there were lots of you can either get a kind of 909 kick drum that only had the 909 controls or something that wasn't really based on that at all um and i sort of thought well no the 909 is a really good starting point for a, for a kick drum so um yeah i had this idea to combine um the ultimate sort of 909 kick drum with um a stereo sidechain compressor and uh yeah i think when people that use them when they get it they have that kind of moment where they think Oh my God! You know, this is just like it makes it so easy to to deal with a kick drum now because mm -hmm. because the compressors, the side chain, sorry, is all built in, and furthermore, the side chain doesn't have to do that <sighs> heavy pumping uh -huh. stuff. That I mean, well, I mean, I love that sound, but you don't have to have that. You can it can be a, a bit more subtle. It can do spectral, right? And do it in um, the way that you would yeah. like, you know, like having you know running a. Your like having different buses in your, yeah, in your yeah. But because again, because it's all integrated, um, the um, the spectral side chaining um, knows what frequency the kick drum is at. So as the because I don't know to do a kick drum sound, it, the the frequency of the kick drum starts quite high. You know, say you know thousand hertz, mm -hmm. and then goes right down to about thirty very quickly. Doom, mm -hmm. doom like that um and the um sidechain compressor follows that frequency and removes everything from the mix that matches that frequency wow so okay all the time as as the That's as cool. the kick drum is decaying the the compressor the sidechain compressor is filtering out just those frequencies that it has to That's cool So it's almost invisible you, Man, I'm like starting yeah. to think like I want to use this like even if it's not even a, a modular track that I'm like just just like uh, just working in my DAW with like guitar tracks and other synth tracks. Yeah. Already seeing like oh I could this would be an excellent especially since I have the the ES9 from Expert Sleepers I can send stuff from my DAW send stuff back, back yeah. and forth and so I feel like like this could be a really it's a, really it's a great way tool. to do a kick drum. I mean if you're, especially yeah. if you're doing dance music, you know yeah. you, you want to have ultimate control. Well, it's it. funny. I think a lot of the people that use it are are DJs yeah. who are playing live. Okay. Sarah, Sarah Summers, um, she uses one. She's always in touch with me about about okay. it. Okay. Um, I'm working yeah. on this track. I'm not sure if you. I I sent you a, a link to the video that I I used it in last week's episode, where I'm just kind of building this track with all of this this new gear. Um, and last night I was listening to the most recent mix, and I was thinking like, I oh, maybe I'm just gonna get like a big four on the floor you know it you know from what might like some drum sound from my daw to just kind of use in that exact like way that yeah. we were just talking about and now i'm like oh well i'm just gonna wait for my cocaine and i'll use it that, that yeah way. it's on its way <laughs> it's on its way i'm just waiting for more chips oh. um but it's honest they're on their way um, oh i have plenty of work to do to wrap my head around the chord yeah. pilot and and uh poly cinematic anyways so um, yeah, yeah yeah no but rush on that <laughs> But so um, yeah, because so cocaine, it was it was lovely. It all just fell fell into place. It was I think I made, I think the final circuit was the second prototype, and that was only because the LED, I think, had been placed the wrong way around or something okay. Okay. simple like that. Um, you know, not normally. I mean, I do you know four or five prototypes to just to get it right, and um, yeah, so it just came together really that one. I was really pleased with it. And um, it's been a bit of a more of a slow burn, I think, cocaine because it's not it's quite a a niche, really. Kick drums in Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. not everybody 
uh, guess what? A lot of people have their own drum machines, so they wouldn't dream of buying yeah. all the bits separately. Um, but I think the people that that get it, the people that are using Eurorack as a groove box, uh, and they've got you know the bass line going on, some sort of top line, um, and uh, and a kick drum, uh, it's quite useful. But it sort of turns it all on its head. You know, most people think of they think kick drum, they think okay, well, I'm going to start the, the song with the kick drum, and I'm going to add stuff on top of that. And, and build it up and build it up and build it up. Um, and what we're actually doing with cocaine is we're, we're putting it right at the very end of the mix. So you, you're doing your entire mix with no kick drum at all, just with the just with the, the hat and the snare and the, and the mm-hmm. bass line and everything. And at the very end of the mix, you put your stereo mix through cocaine and you just trigger it where you want it. And it just wow. it's sort of like it digs a little hole in the mix uh-huh. with the EQ and plops the the kick drum, you know, in there. Whoops, that is so in there cool. for you. And um, yeah, people people just love it. Um, well, so, so something that, like that, especially like hearing about that, and and then you know having having used these, you know, with with modular getting more popular, um, you know, you start to like people that I know who are like our music producers who aren't like into the modular thing, like they start, you know, kind of saying, I'm thinking about it. And, and everybody's worried about gas or it's so expensive and there's so much stuff. And it's like, I think, I think there is going to be, or, or there probably already is like a pretty healthy contingent of people who get into module, like you get a very small modular setup just for like the exact purpose they want from modular. They don't want to make all their music, but it's like, these are handy tools. And I feel like your stuff is like the, like you could just get one of the pod X 64 or whatever from, uh, from four MS, just the tiny, you know, like really affordable case with power and just have just one little tiny piece with a couple, you know, have the cord pilot and that, and the poly cinematic and the kick cane, and then any sort of like maybe effects that you want to control via CV. And then that could just be the only modular component to your old piece. And you don't have to go out and spend, you know, the amount that it would cost to build your own studio in your house. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I suppose that is one, you know, uh, whatever it costs, $400 or something for a kick drum, you know, it's, it's an insane amount of money uh, in some respects, but, mm-hmm. um, you but know, it's not you can, just a kick drum. Right, like no, I mean it's 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 all my stuff's covered, and hence, hence the name. You know, it's covered in knobs. Myself and yeah, yeah. my stuff, and it's <laughs> that's the most expensive part of the hardware. Is, yeah, is, uh, you know, through the whole soldered knobs. Um, well, I want to also get like since you know we're we're kind of pressed for time, but like your aesthetic. We talked about this when we had our our hang the yeah. other day, but like I love that you you know, okay, sure. Like some, you, somebody says you're cheating with, with this, with MIDI or whatever, but like, you could also say, well, you're cheating if you're just doing your, your PCB black, black and gold, because you know, it's like, it's just like, it's easy to do that. And, you know, PCB panels are just fine. I don't have, you know, a preference either way, but it is cool to look in my case and see something that has a lot of character. And I, I understand that everybody, I, I know that when people, I've heard from my other uh, modular designer friends, you know, when they, if they do something outside of the black and gold, like the most common email you get is when are you going to do a black and gold version, which I get it. People like the whole, like making it look nice and, and uniform, but like, I like the patch quilt, the patchwork quilt kind of aesthetic where it's like, oh, wow, that's red and that's purple. I don't know. That just, that's, that makes that's that's cool to me and i love your color scheme i love just like the matte and it's just it's it looks and feels high quality and it also uh has a look about it that like draws me in and invites i always say that i like i like the way you know like the aesthetics of gear are important to me in in that they can they can invite me to play when maybe i'm feeling a little lazy or uninspired you know it's a it's a funny thing. I mean, the 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 the, the reason why I made the polycinematic coloured in the way it is was again because I I thought well if this if other people are going to have this module and they're going to do it on YouTube, I want to be able to spot it. I want to know if someone's yeah. used it. I mean, I was that's how sort of naive I was. I I just thought well you know wouldn't it be great to spot one of my modules? So. So um, let's make it, you know, blue, pink, and gray. And actually, 
uh, that, that exactly that has happened. You know, I was, uh-huh. I was watching a, a video um, of Casablanca, the band Casablanca, who are big, big Nobula fans. Um, I'm actually doing a collab with them, I think, although um, poor old Sean's not so well at the moment. But, um, you know, I was looking at one of their videos on stage and you could see see all these kind of modules and everything was black and aluminium and then there's this pink, blue, <laughs> grey. And you're like, well, I know what that is. Light, and the light's <laughs> yeah. flashing on, I know they're using it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, That's so it was purely cool. selfish reasons, really, for, for for doing it that way. And then since then, it's, it's, it has become more of a thing. And I'm, because I was doing this product image company um, before I did Nobula, so I'm very conscious of how things looked and how they were that presented. And you know, even the boxing. Um, is uh you know the box yeah that's 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 really nice like i uh it's almost almost too maybe it's a little bit over the top but you know it's like i think picture of the module spending, on the box and yeah when you're spending 400 bucks or more on a module you know i've 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 had stuff show up in the mail and it's you know it's a white cardboard box with a stamp on it and then you open it and it's you know just thick you know paper wrapped and then yeah and not to say like I mean, it's nice like, it's there's it's, a there's a reason it's, for it it's quaint and it's it's kind of yeah it is sure. sort of more on brand than what i'm doing you know i, th- I think i'm just a, a frustrated uh sort of non-apple employee who likes the idea of you know making my own sort of iphone for eurorack sort of thing yeah yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm sort of taking the piss out of myself a bit but uh-huh. you know, there is a bit of truth in that 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 you know it's a it's a how often in life do you get a chance to design something from the ground up and make it real? I totally um, agree with that. Yeah. 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 Um, like, and it's uh, even gone to the, you know, I mean, even the specials that we're doing, because we are bringing out black ones, by the way, mm-hmm. um, uh, are, um, you know, I'm making boxes for them uh, as well. Uh-huh. So that's so uh, cool. Yeah. And our, I mean, our old box is still, still the kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. Still got that. And, you know, the, slightly homemade I like the, feel about it. Your the, the your black and like is it? It's black, white, and gray, or is it just black and white? Um, the polycinematic dark mode is um, is black. Yeah, it's black and white. I think they are gray. Um, yeah, that see uh, that just has a classic like eighties synth look to it to me. You yeah. Know? Well, um, um, I buy, I based it on a Moog Prodigy. Uh, which, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, they're my favorite sense. synths. Yeah, to oscillate that's awesome. Sense. Um, um, well, man, I I think this is uh, I think it's 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 very apparent why our five minute meeting, our quote unquote five minute meeting, turned into an hour and a half hang session because, uh, yeah, it's it's fun. You're fun to talk to. We can like we I could spend yeah, yarns. Yeah, I could I could crap on about your <laughs> record, no, till the cows go home, as we say. Um, <laughs> but I do want to like close in on the end because I want to give you you know it's, it's it's evening where you are and uh, you know let you go have your family time and stuff. But I also want to make sure that I give you uh, ample time at the end to make sure you say something that maybe you you were hoping to be able to get out there that you haven't been yet or uh, scream whatever you'd like from the modular mountaintops. Oh gosh, I wasn't ready for that. Um, I mean, I you know, I've 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 said so much. I th- I think I wasn't expecting to talk so much about my kind of career spanning so many years bef- before this point. But um, no, I mean, I, it's 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 been such a um, you know the whole Nobula thing has been such a, an interesting journey, not just for me, but for friends of mine um, and and for my family. Uh, you know, it's like I have my friend Freddie and and um, my son Albie join me at Superbooth every year, and it's it's not that's like I'm awesome. forcing them to come. It's like you know, come on, can we come? Where can we come? Yeah, um, that's so cool. So so it's it's become a really exciting kind of aspect to all our lives. So um, you know, I'm forever grateful, really, for for being part of that community. Community, and it really is a community. I mean, we only showed up three years ago, and it's like you know, everyone I've met in that sphere has, has been so, so welcoming. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, even, even like, um, I forget the guy from Oxy Corral, you know, we, we, we're basically making fairly competing products, you know, and he's like, Oh, Jason, you know, you know, I was, I've been designing this for quite a long time. I didn't just bring it out 
after polycinematic, you know, everyone's so sweet, everyone's so lovely, and everyone would like, oh yeah, I was going to do a kick drum, but I won't now that you've done that, or <laughs> you know, if everyone's sort of just leaving a space for for everyone else. Yeah, it's, um, it's you know, so it's it's been such a, a joy to to get, and I'm still getting to know people, you know, both mm-hmm. sides of the Atlantic. Uh, mm-hmm. This year in particular, um, as you know, I'm trying to do more on the promotional side. You know, I've mm-hmm. created my stable of products now. Now mm-hmm. I just want to get out there and just get to know everyone and, 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 and get to know more people. Yeah. You know, well, seen I've and, got uh, a, a spare it. room and a spare bathroom for guests uh, in, in the house here in Tacoma. So if you, uh, if you ever yeah. make your way out to when the I States, do my world tour. you've got a place to stay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I might well tell you up on that, Tim. Um, <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> I've had um, I've had quite a few synth people stay here. Actually, it's it's been really cool. That's great. And how's your house doing with the uh, with your roundabout? <laughs> we, we've kind of got, I, I did yeah. watch your film, and I kind of thought we've we've sort of got. I don't know whether it's the same. It's certainly not in Canada, where I know quite I know Canada quite well. Um, but uh, here in London, we we're, we're kind of like surrounded by roundabouts. Every intersection is a yeah. roundabout. So we, we're kind of I think we're better at using them um maybe we're more well, used yeah. to seeing them is that was that a yeah. fair comment well so we don't I draw over there's them so part much. of that there's part that because you know like roundabouts i feel like i've always noted like i've noticed that a lot of people don't know how to use them um but so this one isn't so much because it's the lack of knowledge of how to use it it's it's so low to the ground and it has just one little tiny street sign po- po- popped out of it. And um, in the winter time, there's no like foliage or anything in the little patch of grass, let's call it, in in the circular thing that is the roundabout. So it's you, you don't really see it from a, a, uh, a distance. And we are in between two major thoroughfares. So I think people who have recently stolen a car, people who are driving drunk, um, or people who are wanting to avoid, you know, traffic, they use this road and they fly down it. So this this yeah. roundabout has been a vortex of chaos. Um, so I think it's more that because I, I have noticed that in the spring, the all the the amount of accidents and things that happen there does decrease because we get big plants and stuff. So it's like a, I think the visibility is a is a huge aspect of so why. So you're thinking this of one, putting like um, like they're doing Formula One racing. You know, you put like a gravel, put a gravel trap, gravel trap <laughs> yeah. in front of your house. Yeah, you know, and, a, and a row of tires. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I was actually thinking of um, they're called ecology blocks. I don't know if they're called that over the, over on your side of the pond, but they're basically these just giant cement blocks that have these grooves on the bottom and these protuberances on the top that you can kind of stack and you can use them as the foundation of like a giant to hold up walls and stuff if you're building a building or something. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about putting a couple of those um, on the, you know, w- between our, the edge of our yard and the sidewalk and then like framing them in and making them like raised gardens or something. But apparently the city is going to make, you know, like the street, the block, like one block heading to this roundabout um, one way. And then the next block, you know, the, 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 the south block heading north, yeah. the north block, just making it one way um, and putting in some diverters because, yeah, this thing has been crazy. But, um, yeah, to answer your question, w- w- the insurance has been great. The guy doesn't have insurance, so it's coming out of ours. But Oh, that's annoying. So it's all, it's all kind of like everything's in motion. Uh, you know, it's bureaucracies and we got to get this inspector out and this and that. Um, but the insurance has actually been pretty, pretty nice to work with. And uh, it's... I I have a good I feel very very confident that by the end of this we will have at least the same or better looking front porch and um yeah it it will it it will shake itself out in the end I think but it was still a pretty wild I'm sure, thing. I'm sure there'll be a silver lining. Yeah. From it yeah. Somewhere. Hopefully. Yeah. We're, I'm thinking it, I'm thinking there will be. But um I mean I got that cool video out of it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, that was wild. But um but Jason, this was so much fun. Like I yeah. feel like I feel like I, we should just hop online like, you know, every couple of weeks and just hang and, and shoot. Well, yeah, clip, I mean, exactly. I mean, any any time. I'm 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 always around. It's great to to hang out. It'd be nice to do something musical as well. I always feel I don't I don't know what um this platform's like for music. I know um Zoom you can make it a bit more 
audio friendly for music. Yeah, but I find on the Google uh, Meets, as soon as you play, as soon as you do anything that's not speech, it just gets filtered out. Like yeah, magic. there's usually you can turn off the. There's a back. There's like a noise suppression. Uh, like yeah. you can, your settings, like you just turn all of that stuff off and then I'm sure you've figured out the, but a lot of people don't realize that when you're doing something online like this, um, it's only going to recognize channels one and two of whatever interface or wh whatever you're telling your computer to listen on. So if you have a four channel interface and you plug into channel three, like the person on the other end is not going to hear your sound, Yeah, yeah. but there are like these, um, there are free softwares where you can kind of use them as a bridge to send like as many channels as you want into just the channels one and two that the computer is yeah. recognizing. But yeah, it'd be fun to do a little digital That's or virtual good. jam. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I could do more social. I've, I haven't uploaded anything for, for weeks. It's just such hard work. I don't know how you do it, Tim, but um, it's a lot. You know, it's it's you know, crazy. So doing, I sit doing in this room so all many things. I, I spend almost, I spend most of my life in this room. That's how I do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, this was a pleasure, man. I'm gonna yeah. let you have your your the rest of your evening. But yeah, yeah no, thanks thank for, you for your time me. and uh, thanks for sending me this stuff to play with. Like it's it's really really cool. And uh, I was actually playing the uh, the poly cinematic with my guitar via the Ghost Rider um, pedal from from Recovery. But that'll be in a, an upcoming episode. So I'll let that be a cool surprise. Yes, I'm interested in that. Yeah, it's pretty just, fun. So that's like guitar. guitar it turns your guitar into signals mid, into MIDI. Into MIDI, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then straight into the uh, the poly cinematic. And now I'm playing guitar and. That's and a pedal. That's a pedal I want to make. That's a pedal I want to make. Poly cinematic for guitars. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, one day. One day in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Still got a whole a huge backlog to get through, but yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to stop okay. recording, man. Yeah. Um, all right, that's our show. Thank you so much to Jason for coming on. Don't miss out on these Nobula modules. They are so much fun. Uh, thank you to this week's featured artist. If you would like to be a featured artist on PodMod, please send a WAV file and a brief bio to podmodsub at gmail.com. Don't forget, if you want to help out and support the show, you can visit patreon.com forward slash podular modcast, or you can head over to the store and get one of those cool tote bags. Once again, thank you to all the sponsors, Expert Sleepers, Fora Mess, Signal Sounds, Bastel, Novation, and Patchworks. Is Zojo a thing? Do we like do we like that? Do we like where we're going with that? I don't want to like keep doing it if people don't like it. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with it though. <laughs>